And you know, people talk to me and they say, well, you're just a conspiracy theorist. And I say, no, actually, I'm a military strategist. And when confronted with a country like the United States, which has very powerful conventional military, and that is your target, how do you approach it? You charge at it like the folks at the Light Brigade and get blown to pieces? Or do you look at its weak points? And of course, its weak points are the things that make this country a place where everybody wants to live. Our freedom, our open society, our First Amendment, the, the whole nine yards, it becomes an attractant, but it also becomes uh, the gate through which very bad people uh, are free to enter. And they do, and they have in huge numbers. And that's another thing I could talk about for hours, but I'm not going to do it tonight because we don't have that much time. So I always talk about the first principles. And this is the left's first principles. The issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. So it doesn't matter what your issue is, whether it's gay rights, whether it's immigration, whether it's environment, no matter what it is, it is always a pretext for them to insinuate themselves into positions of power in our institutions and to seize our wealth illegitimately. You know, when you think of President Obama's uh, a green jobs program, $80 billion program. Where did all that go? To all of his friends. That's where it went. This is the kind of game they play. And they are using our own money in the battle against us. And that also <clears throat> is a longstanding military tradition under Eastern philosophies written by um, Sun Tzu under, in the art of war use the resources of the enemy. And that's what they're doing. And they're sucking us dry in the process. Sergei said the revolutionary catechism, all they want is our happiness, our enduring happiness. However, in order for us to get that happiness, there first has to be an all destroying revolution. So to achieve that, they're gonna increase our miseries and evils, intensifying them until at last we are driven to a revolt. Doesn't that sound like what's going on today? We're constantly being provoked by people. We're constantly being agitated. We're constantly being, being lied about. We are <coughs> being uh, <clears throat> defamed in public. We are being attacked. We are being sued. We are being infiltrated in our schools. Uh, all of this stuff is outrageous. I don't know if you read, there was a recent discovery in a Massachusetts school um, system where, uh, are there any children in the room here? Um, there was a, a, a textbook that described how a youngster, and I mean prepubescent youngster, could administer oral sex to a grown man. This is in the school textbook. And somebody found it and they blew up and of course they scuttled it immediately. But this isn't unusual. It's not unusual. They're actually trying to um, legitimate pedophilia. And this is all part of this effort to utterly corrupt our society and drive us to rage. And it's being pretty, pretty effective, if you ask me. It's a multi-front strategy, mass immigration to erase identity, stealing elections, which they do on a broad scale. And you can read all the others, doctrinating children, corrupting culture, gun confiscation, and Lots of money for them to grease the skids. Now, a um, very prominent Democrat said, 2008 Democrats, demographics is destiny. And through the immigration program and through illegal immigration, which I go th into extensively in this book, uh, probably more than any book that's ever been written on this subject in one place. 
uh, the, the data that's in it is extremely difficult to come by, and it took me two years to put this together. Um, so once again, I urge you to purchase my book. <laughs> it's really important. It has a lot of good stuff in it, but the most important reason is I need the money. But um, so, but seriously, um, well, I am serious. Uh, uh, so you can see listed there, and I have to go through about 50 slides in 45 minutes, and I've already used up 11. You see what I mean about long wind? And I'm only think I'm on slide six or seven. So I've got to go through here. It's going to be like drinking through a fire hose for you guys. But you can read all the things there, and I will make this PowerPoint available to anybody that wants it as a PDF file. And I will also offer you all the ability to sign up for my Swamp Report, which is a private email that I put out a couple of times a month. Some of you already subscribe to it. I think most people who do will, uh, will sing its praises, because it has a lot of different subjects that I cover in short bullets. And you can learn all about what's going on inside DC, where I have the misfortune of having to go frequently. There's illegal immigration growth. This is the important thing here. Since the 1980s, we've imported over 1 million legal permanent residents every year. And 85% or more have been for family reunification, which is a polite way of saying chain migration. You know, they all talk about how important it is we need people to come into the United States for, for employment. Well, in 2017 or 16, I'm not sure which was the most recent year it's available, it was 12% of that million people. And it was over a million, it was more like 1.2 million. 12% of those came for employment reasons. So it's a sham. What they really want, demographics is destiny. And since the 1965 Immigration Act, which Teddy Kennedy uh, promoted with help from the California Communist Party, uh, their goal has been to bring in minorities from poor nations all around the world. Why? Well, because they'll vote Democrat once they become legal, right? Once they become citizens, they will vote Democrat. Now, they're not even waiting for them to become citizens. They are trying to get them registered, for example, in Texas, uh, by pre-checking the citizenship vote on voter registrations and sending them to legal uh, uh, immigrants or legal uh, permanent residents who, are, who do not yet have citizenship. And the only reason the state attorney general found out about it was because a legal permanent resident came to him and said, oh, am I allowed to vote now? Was there a change in the law or something? <laughs> what? <laughs> and there's a couple hundred thousand of those. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. So you can get a view and you can see what the 1986 uh, amnesty did, brought in, legalized 2.6 million illegal aliens. If we did now, it would be about 30 million. That's how many are here. And of course, we have the border crisis. That just shows the trends in the border crisis. It came down in the last two months. I think uh, Charlie Kirk of... Um, Turning Point USA celebrated the fact that we are only got 50,000 apprehensions last month. Well, guess what? 50,000 was pretty much the peak in 2014. So it's, it's all kind of relative, really. But we still have a massive border crisis that will only be resolved by enforcing our border laws and by erecting the wall. Uh, and despite News to the contrary, the Trump administration is building the wall and the most, it's building it in the most important places where there was fencing before, but it was fencing you could hop over, but it's those places that are the simplest, the easiest to get through. And so they're the first that need to be blocked. And they say that by 2020, they'll have 500 miles of that done. I hope that's true. On the migrant caravans, now this is the one, this is really pretty outrageous. This was not coincidental any more than the migrant crisis in Europe was coincidental. In Europe, 
<clears throat> it was provoked by Russia when in 2015, claiming to uh, go after ISIS in Syria, they instead began bombing residential neighborhoods. And that was what created, I mean, there had been a flow beforehand, but that was what created the massive wave of immigrants. And then at the same time, from all over the Middle East and Africa, others, 80% of the migrants to Europe were not from Syria. But they didn't just decide to up and leave the places they had lived their entire lives for entire generations. They were inspired to do so, told to do so, by an infrastructure of support groups that saw to it that they got to the Middle East, or to, the, to the Mediterranean, and you know, boat people across now. Same thing is true in Central and South America. They arranged this. And the groups here, uh, let's see. What am I doing? Oh, here. Pueblo Sin Fronteras, Centro Sin Fronteras, there, Chicago based. La Familia Latina Unida, founder by an illegal alien. The only reason she's still here is because um, Chicago Congressman um, Gonzalez, I think his name is, interceded and prevented her from being deported. But anyway, she. The Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, which is 80% government funded. And the biggest of all of them, all of these are involved in getting the migrants to the border. They don't walk, of course, they take buses, they're well fed, they're well trained. And the biggest participant is the United Nations with five separate agencies of the UN, chief among them, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, but also UNICEF. Remember we used to collect pennies for UNICEF? We did Halloween when we were kids. UNICEF. And they are there assisting these migrants. And so just for yucks, I want to show you what we're on the hook for when it comes to the United Nations. If you look at those um, bottom two rows, on average, we've been providing 17% of the UN budget since 2010. Interestingly, under Obama, it went down substantially. I wonder why that is. Uh, but look at the percent contribution to the UN High Commissioner. 37% of the UN High Commissioner's money comes from the United States. Now, conversely, China and Russia, who are really the beneficiaries of this, because this whole agenda is designed to create chaos and fracture our nation and divide us and polarize us along racial, ethnic, and religious lines. That's, that's the agenda. Um, they are the beneficiaries of that. We are their main enemy, and they are. this is one of their asymmetric strategies to destroy our nation. <clears throat> Look how much they contribute to the, the two of them together contribute 0.4% to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees budget. It's, it's like $4 million, and we commit billions. And they do not t accept any refugees, none, or any emigres, none. They have big walls. There are big walls uh, blocking off all of Eastern Europe, despite the so-called fall of the Soviet Union. Eastern Europe and Russia have completely blocked themselves off from that, and nobody ever questions them about that. I wonder why that is. Angela Merkel, the uh, former uh, chancellor for West Germany, most people don't know this, she's the one who basically opened the floodgates and allowed this agreement that all of the European nations had to um, share borders. She was, actually, she was actually an East German communist. Most people don't know that. She was a leader in the Communist Youth League in East Germany, and when the wall fell, she emigrated to the West and insinuated herself into the most popular uh, German political party and found her way to the top. I guarantee you she was doing Putin's bidding 
when she opened the borders. It wasn't any kind of ideological argument on her behalf. This was a military strategy. She is an East German communist. These are the kind of things you need to understand. <clears throat> so the refugee resettlement program, and I showed you this last year too, the refugee resettlement program has plummeted since Trump, Trump was elected because he has one little bit of control that nobody can argue about, and that is he decide, decides what the refugee cap is every year. So there's, he said 45,000 in 2018, 30,000 in 2019, and I gotta tell you, you know, a lot of that, I know this because I know folks on the inside, it's Steve Miller, you know, his advisor, Steve Miller, basically singularly took on the State Department bureaucracy, which is wholly against this, you know, militantly against this. And he defeated them and said, we're going to get 45,000 last year, we're going to get 30,000. And then uh, they imposed what Trump said was extreme vetting, which is actually really vet, pe vet people who are coming, which they never really had done before. They just processed them. And that further created a bottleneck. So last year there was about 22,500 and this year, we might get as many as 30,000, uh, but that's it. And they're talking about for 2020, and they'll announce that this month, they're talking about zero. I can't wait. I hope that happens. Because these people are resettled through private government contractors that get a lot of money being paid for the head by the head, and I'll go get into that a little bit. But the trouble is, this great news, excuse me, such as it is, but the trouble is the Refugee Resettlement Program is not the Refugee Resettlement Program. This is the Refugee Resettlement Program. It includes special immigrant visas. It includes uh, real asylum seekers or quasi-real. It includes the Cuban-Haitian Entrant Program, although that's slowing down a bit. It includes trafficking victims and the UACs there unaccompanied alien children really should be called uh, alien minors and they're actually not unaccompanied usually they are accompanied by families or other people's families so the whole thing is misleading and so while we reduce the amount of refugees we still have a, a very large number in 2018 coming in 100,000 and this plug number for, of a million that's UACs and families, which has already been projected by the um, Department of Homeland Security from all of the border flooding. So that's a plug number. It might not be correct, but it's, uh, it's huge no matter what it is. And why did this happen? And Michael Anthony Peruca, I think, will talk about this. We have judges who ignore and betray and violate the U.S. Constitution on a daily basis, don't we, Michael? We, do. we sure do. And I believe Michael will agree with me when I say we have a legitimate right to ignore them. And I just wish that Trump would take that advice. So this is a snapshot of the uh, <clears throat> refugee resettlement program budget. And I don't want to, you know, guys all buried in the weeds here, but one thing you should notice is if you look at all the line items, uh, overseas contingency operations, those are things that we, we provide. This is how the refugee program should work. Most refugees don't want to come to the United States. They're in refugee camps. We should provide them with comfortable living there so that when whatever the situation is that caused them to become refugees is resolved in their home countries, they can return home, which almost all of them want to do, frankly. That's what they say when they're surveyed. But we have a different agenda. Our demographics is destiny, left-wing politicians, and all of the organizations that benefit financially from this program do not want that. They want them all to come here. So, but what's the biggest program there aside from overseas contingency operations? Look at this. It's the Unaccompanied Alien Children Program. Our biggest refugee program is for illegal aliens. 
they're not even supposed to be here. And these are VOLAGs, voluntary agencies. These are the grants they get. And I've circled uh, the International Rescue Committee and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops because they make more money than anybody else. But if you can see, because of the reduction in uh, refugees this year, they haven't made nearly as much as they had before. And then we have the UAC contractors. Look how much the two largest ones made in 2018. That's the Baptist Child and Family Services. $440 million. And Southwest Key, which is run by a left-wing, open borders, uh, Hispanic guy, uh, $626 million. And that's primarily for housing uh, and transporting illegal aliens. So they get a lot of funding, but the thing about the, the Catholic bishops is that's not all the work they do. Catholic bishops got $67.6 million when you add in the Unaccompanied Alien Children Program, but all the programs that they administer for the various federal agencies came to $561 million in 2018 alone. From 28, 2008 to 2018, it's $4.3 billion. $4.3 billion to the Catholic Church. Is it any wonder that the Catholic Church has turned hard left and become just another mouthpiece for the open borders agenda? Is there any surprise there? No. Money walks. And because the Catholic Church has had so many scandals in other areas, uh, this has been a great supplement for them. It's a huge amount of money. Catholic Charities also, they made uh, 14 million alone in unaccompanied alien children, but with all the programs together, they made over 118 million. And the International Rescue Committee is similar. It goes on and on. And take a look at the compensation their directors get for essentially administering a grant. I mean, you know, this is not like running a Fortune 500 uh, organization where you need to be on top and you need to be uh, producing and proving yourself every single day, you know, either turning a country or company around or improving the bottom line of that co company. These guys sit behind a desk, work nine to five, administer a grant, and it's, you know, it's the kind of stuff we could do in our sleep. Look what they made. Juan Sanchez, almost $800,000 a year. Ah, Kevin Dinan of the Baptist Child Family Services, 502000 That's not bad for church work. <laughs> you know, I think maybe I'll kind of go into that, you know. Make pretend I'm a Christian pastor or a Christian whatever and become a wealthy man. I sure don't do it this way, I promise you. Once again, I need the money. <laughs> Diversity, however, is not our strength. We hear that slogan all the time, diversity is our strength. Well, when the left says that, they mean it, because of course it is their strength, because it works for all their agendas. This is my favorite table in the whole book. How many languages are spoken in public school in the United States today? Over 400. And some uh, municipalities, there's 50, 75, 80, 100. Federal Washington is 120 different languages spoken in their public school. How do you administer it? How do you teach anybody with that? And what's the cost of English as a second language? It, it just, it's astronomical. So. Our students are not being taught. They are being thrown into uh, schools with dizzying arrays of different cultures, many of which clash, and they're not learning anything. That is not our strength. 
but that is the left strength because they want stupid, malleable people that they can then indoctrinate once they get them to college or even in high school. My own daughters, I see that. It's terrible. And then, because of this mass immigration, both legal and illegal, the demographics of our society are changing. And of course, the reason that it matters is because most minorities, as the left knows, vote Democrat. In uh, Texas, it's actually a lower percentage, uh, largely due to the efforts of George Bush. But it, by the same token, it's, it's a double-edged sword. They support Republicans in that state because Republicans give them what they want. And what do they want? Amnesty. And so, as it stands right now, um, Hispanics uh, are a larger population in Texas than uh, whites, and the only reason Texas remains a red state is because Hispanics vote at a rate of about 20%. And so guess who's down there with all of his buddies registering people to beat the band, whether they're illegal or legal. And by the way, illegal aliens ben uh, can provide a benefit also simply by going into Hispanic districts and speaking the language. So they use illegal aliens to help uh, register voters, get them to the polls. We could easily, Texas could become a blue state in the next election or election thereafter. And if that happens, we will never see a Republican president again. Same thing in these other states. Demographics is destiny. And they repeated again after the 2018 election and they got together, George Soros and a bunch of fat cats got together with these people to uh, collaborate on how they might make this, uh, exploit this in 2020. And currently, the Democratic Socialists of America, which is the largest communist group in the United States, they're not democratic, they're not socialist, they're communist, uh, they are <clears throat> attempting to register 40 million people to vote in 2020. And they are working hard at it. Now, you know, we know how these people organize. We know how they work. So they're working hard at it. Now, here's our side of that story. There are 40 million Christians in the United States who are not voting. 40 million. 15 of the million of those have not even registered. Now, that is a game changer for our nation. But it's only a game changer if those people decide to participate. You know, I hear all the time from evangelical Christians, well, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Well, honestly, that's the biggest cop out I ever heard in my life. It's really an excuse to sit on your rear end and do nothing, to not get involved and stay comfortable. We indeed have a uh, paradise waiting for us in heaven if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our savior. But that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to do what's right here and now. In fact, it's our job to work harder to do what's right here and now. Not merely for our us, but for our children, for our neighbors, for our friends, for our society. That statement drives me nuts. <laughs> to be honest with you, because it's a cop-out. It's dishonest. Well, I can go into crime tables, and Dave is waving at me. Once again, long wind has talked too long. Um, talk about welfare use, off the charts. Uh, here's an interesting table. When Trump was elected, they got the Health and Human Services Department to divulge how much they spend on refugees. And uh, for the last 10 years, they've spent $125.7 billion. So that's uh, $12.5 billion a year. And that's with the items that they include here. But look what they've excluded. These are all the things that have not been counted. And I just added three more. I added 
supplemental security income, food stamps, and federal housing, that's, it comes out to 3,000 a person, that adds another 3,500 a person. So how much if you added all those things up for refugees and asylum seekers, do you think you'd be paying per person? 12, 15, $20,000 per person? Easily. This is a crisis strategy, the Cloward Piven strategy. I've talked about this. I don't know if I've talked about it with you folks. I gave this information to Len Beck and he turned it into a series on his show back when it used to be on Fox. They created a strategy for overwhelming our welfare system with demands for services. They wrote an article in 1965 and the idea was to pack the, voter, the, the, the welfare rolls with people with, for every single thing they could possibly receive, not to help them, but to collapse the system. And it was Cloward and Piven's strategy that resulted in the bankruptcy of New York City in 1975. And Rudy Giuliani named them as economic saboteurs. Well, that's what's going on now with all this various immigration programs and all of the other programs that are just overwhelming our nation with massive burdens from every direction, recalling once again the Chayev intent on increasing the evils and miseries until we are driven to revolt. I was going to go tomorrow to Michigan. And I was going to speak to a very big church there. Council on American Islamic Relations got wind of it. They uh, sidled up to a couple of Democrat Congress people and some state legislators, and they pressured the church. And it's a long involved story that started last Friday and went all the way through till uh, Tuesday or Monday, rather. But Long and short of it was the church canceled it. The church caved in to their uh, demands. And so I'm not going tomorrow. I am going Friday because I have a bunch of other uh, speaking assignments out in Michigan. But that one was huge. And it was written up in the Washington Post yesterday. You can read all about it in the Washington Post. I'm famous now. Not the kind of fame I want. Uh, they were... Uh, Local News 7 quoted Nada al Hanuti, who is the executive director of M Gage Michigan, which is a Muslim group. Look who she is. She's the daughter of the chief of care, Michigan, who was jailed for spying for Saddam Hussein. She's a granddaughter of another man who was indicted in the Holy Land Foundation trial. And she claims speech is incitement. Now, that's important. And I've only got a couple more minutes, but I'm going to talk about this. Five minutes will give me. That's good. <clears throat> Think, keep that word in your mind, incitement. Because this is a word that has gotten a lot of publicity lately, Islamophobia. Now, we all know Islamophobia is a contrived word, just like homophobia is, xenophobia, and all of these... Uh, hyperbolic words designed to provide our enemies with a shorthand way of defaming us. If you say anything negative about Islam or Islamic terrorism, you're automatically an Islamophobe. And read what Isam Omish here says is Islamophobic. And it's really pretty funny because if you look, he says, Islamic terrorism, Islamic terrorists, Islamic violence, violent jihad, Islamic jihad, any of those things. Wait a minute. Remember Ayman al-Zawahiri, now the head of al-Qaeda? What was his, what was the organization he came from? He was an Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood member. You know what the name of his organization was? Egyptian Islamic Jihad. <laughs> so, I'm in al Zawahiri as an Islamophobe, folks. I mean, this is how absurd this is. But it, but it begs a question. 
you know, we have Al-Shabaab, we have ISIS, we have uh, Al-Qaeda, we have dozens, dozens of Islamic terrorist groups. You know, if they're not Islamic, then Islam has to be the most widely misunderstood religion in the history of the world. Because I'm looking here and I want all you evangelical underwear bombers to line up on this side. And I want the shoe bombers to line up on that side. I want the suicide bombers in the back row here. I'm waiting for the Mennonite terrorists to show up. Yeah, no, no. Gee, wonder why, gosh. So how is it that that is such a thoroughly misunderstood uh, religion or at least religious, religious tenets? Well, it's not, but his goal is to silence us. So if you say anything untowered towards Islam, you are an Islamophobe and that comes directly out of the Organization for Islamic Cooperation's uh, effort to create blasphemy laws in international law and in the United States. And they were successful in 2009 getting the UN to pass Resolution 1618, and you can read it there, combating intolerance, negative stereotyping, and stigmatization of and its discrimination, incitement, there's that word, to violence and violence against persons based on religion or belief. Well, the UN, we know, does not care about Christianity. They don't care about Jews. They despise Israel. They're trying to wipe it off the map. So what religion are they talking about? Islam, of course. And incitement, if you go back to this list, uh, you cannot say these words or you are being hateful and you are inciting violence. So if you call an Islamic terrorist an Islamic terrorist, you're basically giving him the green light to attack you as an Islamic terrorist because you're calling him an Islamic terrorist. We are guilty of incitement when we identify them for doing what they're doing. It's insanity, but it's designed to silence us, shut us down. A couple more minutes? Just a couple more minutes. So what is the Council on American Islamic Relations? Because most people don't know this, and these are really important slides, because they're very, very malevolent, and they're very, very omnipresent, as was best demonstrated uh, in Michigan this week. They were created in 1993 at a secret meeting in Philadelphia. They are the U.S. branch of the Palestinian terrorist group Hamas, and they have been so identified in court documents. They're unindicted co-conspirators in the Holy Land Foundation terror tri financing trial. And the only reason they're unindicted is because Obama was elected and he shut down the investigation. Otherwise, CARE would not be an entity today. Many of its leaders would be in jail. Many of its leaders are in jail anyway. Here's a, here's a rundown. CARE Texas sentenced to 65 years. Randall Royer, this one I love, he's a former care communication specialist. He joined, uh, I forget, Lakshi M. Al Islami or something like that. It's a Pakistani terrorist group that was responsible for the Mumbai hotel attack. And there are a number of ones, of, of other ones. CARE's director, Nihad Awad, was formerly the director of a PLO student organization in the United States. PLO is a communist organization, so what he's saying here is that when he was younger, he was a, a dedicated communist. I'm not sure he's not still a dedicated communist. All of this stuff. Oh, look at that, a white nationalist. Who would have thought? He's a judge in Minnesota who said that we have a terrorist cell here and he convicted nine Somalis. Now, this is what I want you to read and then I'll be done. Muslim statements on the Council on American Islamic Relations. CARE warned Somali Muslims in Minnesota not to talk to the FBI because they, were, they had people there recruiting for Al-Shabaab and ISIS. And the response from the people was, CARE supporting, these are quotes, CARE supporting the groups we suspect of recruiting our kids. We refuse to be silent. Protesters at one demonstration shouted, care out, double speak out. These are Muslims, folks. 
talking about CARE, which is supposedly this great Islamic peaceful organization. In 2013, the Westgate Mall attack involved two Somali Muslims from Minnesota. 67 non-Muslims were killed. They asked them if they were Muslim or non-Muslim before they shot them in the head. 200 wounded. Look what Ibrahim Hooper of CARE had to say about that. Terrorism is terrorism, whether it's Americans involved or anyone. Who cares? Who cares? He said that publicly. And then a guy whose nephew was killed by al-Shabaab because he had second thoughts after joining them. Uh, a Muslim, this man, testified before Congress. He said he tried to warn America. He said, care, say I'm a bad person. In your 2013 Islamophobia report, this Somali Muslim from Minnesota was labeled as an Islamophobia. microphone so we'll keep voting <laughs> um, there was a seminary professor I had that told us that there were um, five letters of the alphabet to follow whenever we got up to speak B B B B B be brief, brother, be brief. <laughs> so remember that, and I love you. <laughs> well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My Bible says that this is the day the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad. Are you glad tonight? I know. Let's give our, the Lord a great big praise offering, shall we? It's very brief, and, and, and being the BBB philosophy. It's real simple. I need you to stand. That's the first one. The second part is that I appreciate Pastor David Lewis for every year putting this together, this 9-11. And I believe I've been here all but one. And tonight it is a beautiful crowd. So give yourselves a hand for being here. Amen. The other thing that I need to say that my brother Simpson did such a fabulous job, a couple of things that I want to point out to you about the Catholic Charities. This past year, I put a bill in called the Heartbeat Bill. Or anybody familiar with the Heartbeat Bill? That all it simply said was to allow the mother to hear the heartbeat of that child. Now, I will tell you that the Catholic Charities told me that they were coming. Archbishop told me he was coming. He was going to get some people to testify. The day of my hearing, guess what? There was three or four words that said, we support this document. Tells you something, doesn't it? You take their thought away. You take their, 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 their ways to, to raise the money. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to put that heartbeat bill back in again. I'm going to stand up. Because I truly believe that if that mother has the opportunity to hear that heartbeat of that child, she'll go the other way and give that child up for somebody that would love it in the family. Amen. I say that to say this. Pastor has done this, and he, it's not a cheap event. This is an expensive event. And when you put a great event on, it costs you a dollar. Now, I will tell you that I will be the first to tell you that I will be glad to come to your church and raise any kind of money for you as I can. But if I have to ask you for $2 for my campaign, I would never do it. It's hard for me to do that. But I need to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I need you to reach into your pocketbooks tonight or your wallets or your checkbook to write a check out to Cub Hill Bible Presbyterian Church and to be a good offering. This is fertile ground. This type of ministries that we bring every year is a great opportunity. How many has learned something even tonight? That's right. Now get in your other hand and put in your wallet and pull out something great. Now, if I could have some ushers, let us pray. I want you to really think about this for a moment. Give a great offering. Give the biggest bill that you've got in your pocket tonight. It's just money. It's just a tool. Father, I love you tonight. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. And Father, as I heard today, we'll not forget, but we'll always remember 9-11. 
we'll remember exactly where we were at the moment that happened. And Father, for just 24 hours ago, over 3,000 people a year ago were having their last time with their families. And today, 18 years later, there's still many suffering. There's still sickness. But Father, we're learning and hearing more about the Al-Qaeda, all of this hypocrisy, all of this demonic. But Father, tonight we're asking you to touch the hearts of your sons and daughters to give an abundance, an abundance of rain, abundance of blessing in their life. And Father, that when you allow that person to give and they give a great gift, you'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out them a shower of blessing. We'll give you the praise, give you the honor, and give you the glory. And everybody says, Amen. I'm looking forward to this, brother. Go ahead. That way, when you hear a saxophone, you give good money. <laughs> people said amen. amen thank you so much jack what a talent the lord has given you all right we are moving right along i promised you two speakers this evening and i would like to ask michael anthony perutka from the institute on the constitution to come up please and let us know what the lord has put on your heart brother thank you can, can jack play again as much as you want him to, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> Woo! That was that was excellent. All right, everybody on this side of the room, look at everybody on that side of the room, and and tell them something for me. Here we go. So repeat after me. Socialism is anti-American. Now you tell them back. Socialism is not biblical. Ladies and gentlemen, the essence of socialism is theft. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Let me just uh, take a minute and thank Pastor Lewis and all the people who have put this on, uh, Delegate Metzger for being here tonight. My buddy Howard Sharp from WCBM is here uh, watching over things. WCBM is, give, gives a voice to, to many of us, uh, including Pastor Lewis, who does such a tremendous job with his commentaries. Um, I'm uh, 
conscious very much of being in a room with uh, uh, with people who know the Constitution and with people who uh, care about their country and their country's government. I'm also conscious of being in the room with people who are real musicians. Uh, and I'm an amateur musician, so I'm, I'm, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm conscious of that. Let me just say that. All right. The essence of socialism is theft. Essentially, the goal of a socialist is to steal your stuff and take it for himself. But a socialist is a little more sophisticated than a mugger or a burglar because a socialist gets the government to do the otherwise potentially dangerous work of stealing your property from you. A socialist uses the power of the state to force you to surrender your property, and this is what Frederick Bastiat called legal plunder. Please say that, legal plunder. In his book, The Law, Bastiat describes this process, and he asks the hard question that I think we have to ask ourselves. He asks this question. He says, what do I do when those entrusted with enforcing the law use the law to break the law? What do I do when those who are charged with enforcing the law use the law to break the law? See, when I was growing up, and I think when you were growing up, Socialism was a pejorative. If you called somebody a socialist, you were hurling an insult at them, weren't you? To call someone a socialist was an insult, but not anymore. Socialist propaganda is openly promoted and championed by both major parties. Both parties. How did this happen? Schools. Ever since the middle of the last century, the public schools have been indoctrinating America's children to accept and even demand socialist programs. Indeed, and in fact, this is precisely what the public schools were designed to do. Most people don't realize this, and many more people know it's true, but they don't want to face it. From their beginning, the schools were designed to steal your stuff by stealing your kids who would then give them your stuff. So if you want to keep your stuff and your kids, you might want to consider homeschooling them. You can actually begin that process by picking up a copy of our U.S. basic course tonight and sharing it with your children and your grandchildren and your pastor and your attorney. During my term on the Anne Arundel County Council, I voted against the adoption of the proposed county budget four years in a row. I was, thank you. Uh, which was interesting because I was a Republican and our county executive who proposed the budget was a Republican, but I voted against it four times in a row, notwithstanding. And on each of the occasions, the vote was six to one against me. I was severely criticized by the leftist local press and by public school advocates, of course, for my refusal to support their relentless demands for more funding. Relentless. Currently, the public schools in my county devour more than two-thirds of the $1.5 billion budget of my county. And of course, it's not enough. It's never enough. But aside from the runaway spending, the far more important reason that I voted against four budgets is because of the destructive mission of the schools themselves. You see, it's no accident. It is no accident that the public schools promote a godless socialist agenda leading to the dumbing down of the culture. And it's no accident that they promote immorality under the guise of diversity. And it's no accident that students are immersed in radical environmentalism leading to nonsense like the Green New Deal. And it's no accident that public schools train children to dismiss and to despise the values of their parents, leading to the disintegration of the family. And it's no accident that public schools drain the resources of the citizenry, making it more difficult for families to educate their children privately. All of this is purposeful and intended to destroy America and remake it as a godless, 
socialist empire created by America's enemies. You don't have to take my word for this. You could look it up. You could look it up in the words of Horace Mann, John Dewey, and others. Created by America's enemies, the public schools are destroying my county, and they must be disestablished before they destroy my country. Which brings me to Hank Stram, of course. Of course. Kansas City Chiefs legendary football coach, Hank Stram, was a big fan of what he called the misdirection play. Wish I had a big picture of Hank Stram up here. I used to love to listen to Hank Stram. Jack Buck, Hank Stram, Monday nights. The idea of the misdirection play was that the offensive formation and the actual start of the football play would seem to lead in one direction, but really go in another. If you listen to the news and you listen to the Democrat debates and some of the things that you hear, you might, uh, it might occur to you that, that uh, what you're seeing is Hank Stram's misdirection play. And here's what I mean. Climate change has nothing to do with the climate. It has to do with socialism. The charitable welfare state has nothing to do with charity. It has to do with socialism. Medicare for all has nothing to do with health care. It has to do with socialism. Even gun control has nothing to do with guns or controlling them. It has to do with enforcing a tyrannical socialist system. Environmental protection has absolutely nothing to do with protecting the environment. It has to do with socialism. And public education has nothing to do with education. It has to do with indoctrinating your children into accepting and promoting and even demanding socialism. Tell them again, socialism is anti-American. Socialism is anti-biblical. Socialism, tell them, is destructive of liberty. Tell them, socialism is slavery. Every time you hear, thank you, every time you hear about climate change, you got one more? Go ahead. X temp, all right. Every time you hear about climate change or environmental protection or Medicare for all or more money for public education, I want you to think about Hank Stram and the misdirection play, and I don't want you to get faked out. Not getting faked out is what the rest of this talk is about. And I'm really hoping the pastor didn't come forward already to tell me I'm done. <laughs> but if he moves to the next pew, I'm in trouble. I know that. Okay. But I want us to not get faked out. I, don't, I want us to be like the men of Issachar. And by the way, I was trying to look up Issachar today. There's an H in it somewhere. So if, when you're trying to look up Issachar, remember there's, a, there's an H in it. Uh, that is to say, we have to understand the times. The men of Issachar understood the times. And we need to be prepared to engage in the culture war that is upon us. We can't shrink from it. We have to be engaged in it. So we need to prepare the biblical Christian for engagement in the culture war. Thank you so much. He told me right before I walked up here, don't forget to pick up the mouse. All right, how did, how did I get here to this, to this moment here in my thinking here? Um, a couple of years ago, do you remember Kim Clark? She was the she was the clerk out there in in uh, in Kentucky who refused to give the marriage license to the same sex couple. Remember that? Okay. Well, I got a call from this guy. This guy. Hold it. This guy. I don't. How, how many of you know Cal Zastro? Cal Zastro is is you guys. Cal Zastro is is a pro-life warrior, an absolute hero, and he's a boombox. He just, he just radiates uh, uh, righteousness, if you will, and uh, he, he's actually from, lives in Michigan, but he's originally a cheesehead. He's from Wisconsin, and he's, he's, a, he's a, a wonderful guy. He gave me a call one, one Thursday. I think I returned the call on Friday, and he said, uh, I need you tomorrow. Now, I live in Maryland, and this was happening in Kentucky. He said, I need you to come to this rally for Kim Davis, and I can give you 10 minutes. So you got to be here. It was about it was about a 14-hour drive, and when I when I talked to him, I was about 20 hours out 
of the of the time that I had to be there. So I had to cover 14 hours. Anyway, he said, I want you to drive, to, I want you to get out here to Kentucky by tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, and I'll give you 10 minutes. So uh, I said, uh, and, and he said, I, not, I not, don't really want you to do so, something so much as I want you to undo something. I want you to undo something. G.K. Chesterton said, what Americans are always looking for is, is somebody to come along, a great man to come along and do something. But what we really need is a man to come along and undo something, right? So Cal said to me, I want you to undo 170 years of, of indoctrination in my government schools. This is 10 minutes, right? I want you to un, undo uh, 250 years of, inform, of, of indoctrination, excuse me, let's say 250? 150 years of indoctrination of the legal profession by law schools and 75 years of indoctrination by TV and the major media, not to mention the United States federal government, right? So I said, so, so I, I said, I can, I'll try to hit that pitch. I can do that. So I went out there. I drove out there. He gave me 10 minutes. I think I, oh, I'm so scared about being overtime. I, he, I, I think I did this in about eight and a half minutes. And I, I tried to make the point. I, I tried to make the point that Kim Davis had broken the law because there is no law which requires her to issue a marriage license to same-sex couples. Contrary to popular belief, the Supreme Court opinion ruling in Obersfeld versus Hopkins, Hodges, excuse me, is not a law. And I, being a local official at the time, I was a member of the Anne Arundel County Council, I was trying to talk to the local officials there and say, there is no law which allows the judge to hold her. There is no law. So release her or show me the law or release Kim Davis. Show me the law or release Kim Davis. And that was the rallying cry. Show me the law or release Kim Davis. So then I get a call from this guy. Recognize this guy? And he, and, uh, he said, Michael, you, you have, you get, I'm going to give you 30 minutes. And what I want you to do is not do something, but, but, but what I want you to do is undo 170 years of indoctrination by government schools and 150 years of indoctrination of, of the legal profession by what they call law schools. I went to one. Uh, and 75 years of indoctrination by TV and major media, not to mention the United States federal government. And I said, no problem. I did it in eight and a half minutes. I can come do it. I can come do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm kidding with you here. But uh, to win the culture war, to win this war, we have to know the rules of engagement. We have to know the law. We have to know what law is and what law isn't because these socialist programs that are forced upon us, we sometimes go, well, it's a law of the land. Or that, and we need to know, we need to know what law is and what law isn't so that we know when to resist and so we know when to hold our elected officials responsible for resisting on our behalf, right? So what law is and what law isn't? So here's my objective. I can just barely see that. Can, can we make that just a tad bigger? Oh, no. All right. All right. My objective, excuse me for doing that to you here. Um, and my, my cousin Neil is here tonight. He, he, he taught me that you always have to have objectives. You can't start something without an objective. So here's, here's the objective. My objective tonight is to present the issue of what law is and what law isn't in a manner so straightforward and so clear that the audience, that's you, will be able to articulate and effectively communicate the truth to family, community, and culture. That's the objective, okay? We're gonna do that in the next eight minutes, all right? So then, if we do that, then together, we can undo 170 years of indoctrination by government schools, 150 years of indoctrination by what they call law schools, and 75 years of indoctrination by TV and major media, not to mention the United States federal government, okay? That's what we're gonna do. Now, central to this legal argument, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to teach you this legal argument. Okay, it's central to this legal argument uh, is this. This legal argument is central to why Kim Davis was not a law, an oath was an oath keeper, not a law breaker. Okay, so before you leave here, you're going to be able to articulate this. Uh, but first, because I'm a little concerned about running overtime, I'm going to jump to the end of my speech right now. I'm going to get to the ending, and then I'll come back and do the middle, okay? So when I came home from the Kim Davis rally, I was inspired to do what I sometimes do. I'm, a, I'm an amateur musician. For 50 years, I've been an amateur musician. When, when, you, when you hear me play, you'll know why. Um, so so uh, I, I was inspired by what I saw there, and I, I wanted to, to bring this to, to in, in, into, into the musical genre, and I wrote a song, and the song is called Courts Cannot Make Law, okay? Say this after me, courts cannot make law. Courts cannot make law. 
The case law method has a fatal flaw. Courts cannot make law. And the only other part that you got to remember is ooh, wop, wop. Okay? All right, here's, here's, here, this is, by the way, was our first music video, and, and Rob McQuay is here. He actually put together this, this uh, film for me, okay? So, please. Hmm? Oh, okay, I'm going to introduce this and show you a little commentary where I introduce this, and then I hope you enjoy the music. Here, here we go. One more time. I'm sorry to say, I'm afraid you and I have been brainwashed. The dictionary defines brainwashing as making someone about radically different beliefs by using systematic pressure. One form of pressure is repetition. Here's an example of what I mean. You know that the United States Constitution provides for a separation of church and state, thus prohibiting Bible instruction and prayer in public schools. And you know that appellate courts make law by means of opinions of orders handed down by judges. Well, the fact of the matter is that none of this is true. The phrase separation of church and state is nowhere to be found in the Constitution, and all legislative authority is vested in the legislative branch, leaving no authority for judges to make law. So, now, I've told you, and you know the truth. But even though you know it, you still don't believe it. Why? Repetition. You've heard it over and over and over from media, government, and academia. You've heard it so many times that you are brainwashed. So I'm here to help. I've written a little song, put together a music video called Courts Cannot Make Law. And all you have to do to get unbrainwashed is to listen to it over and over and over again. And sing along. So you are completely unbrainwashed. You're welcome. I hope you enjoy the video. There's a battle going on. A war for your soul. It's a devil's deal. It's fire control. They want you to believe that you have no hope. They've got another bag that you are. Well, they tell you the rules that you want to be. They know that you won't question. They know that you won't be. They've lived their lives for way too long. It's time to know about the problem. No matter who you are, they want you to be bothered. Of course, you can understand how they want the case law that has a law because courts cannot make law. The courts cannot make law. The courts cannot make law. The case law that has a law because courts cannot make law. The the law, the courts make none. That's in the Constitution, it's an article one. Look it up, read the words, you should all do the lies when the world on the spot. Tell your children, tell your mama, tell your family, tell your friends, tell your neighbors if you want to be free. You won't learn the truth if you've got the stones. It's up to you to know the rules, no matter what you are. Courts and judges can't die in the bar. The case law will never be so bad in the bar because courts can't die in the bar. All right, see how simple it is? You see how easy it is? 
All right, the legal argument. That was the end of my speech. All right, so now I got to go back and get the, get the middle in here. Okay, the legal argument. Ready, set, go. Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution. The very first sentence of the Constitution, after the preamble, the very first sentence, Article 1, Section 1 says, all, let's just stop right there. What's all mean? All. Anybody confused on what all means? All right, here's the rest of the sentence. That's the very first word of the Constitution. All, all legislative powers herein and granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States. That's the very first sentence, okay? Got that? All lawmaking authority is vested in Congress. So if all lawmaking power is vested in Congress, how much is left over for the courts? Do, do the math. You got, the, you got anybody confused with that, that? All right, you now know the legal argument. You got it. By the way, as a sidebar, how much is left over for executive orders to be law? I'm not saying there are no such things as legal as, as, as court opinions or executive orders. But what I'm saying is they ain't law. They can't be law because all lawmaking authority is vested in Congress. You see that? All right. So now you know the temporal or what I'm calling the temporal or horizontal argument. But there's more. There's a vertical argument as well. The eternal or vertical argument. OK, and we only have uh, one minute left. So let's hurry up. Declaration of Independence. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, I've color-coded it here into, into a couple of colors here, and the, the first page I made yellow and the next three pages made blue. And the reason I've done that is just to illustrate that about three-quarters of the document is a list of complaints. It's a list of grievances against the king and against parliament, okay? So my, uh, it's, I think it's 27 grievances against, that are listed there. So my, my question to you is this. If you have 27 grievances against the king, but the king is the ultimate law giver. There's no appeal. Whatever comes out of the mouth of the king is the law. What does it matter if you have 27 grievances or 127 grievances or 8,027 grievances? Does it make any difference? If you're up against the law giver, the ultimate authority, right? So if it was just a list of complaints, if that's all the Declaration of Independence was, I would suggest that you wouldn't even know about it. It would have been lost to history. It wouldn't have been an important document at all. But what our founders did on that yellow page there, on that gold page, let's call it gold, they made a legal argument, and that's our legal argument today. And that legal argument said that there's a lawgiver above the king that the king owes allegiance to and that the king has to obey, and he's not doing it. And they made the argument with these underlying presuppositions. They said that all men were created equal. Now, what do you have to presuppose to make such a, a statement? What do you have to already believe? That there's a creator, God. And that there was a creation, by the way, as well, right? You're already positing that. They already believe that. That's part of an underlying presupposition of American jurisprudence, right? There is a God. Then they went on to say that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. So they not only said they are God, there's a God, they said our rights come from him. Then they said that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Now, when somebody's running for office, as I, as I did, and they walk in your driveway or knock on your door, or they, or they, uh, they call you a phone, they want your support, they want your money, they want your vote, right? I think a very fair question to ask them is what's the purpose of government? Ask him that question, and it's a, such a simple question, it's a stumper, but just ask him, what's the purpose of government? And then shut up and let him answer and don't help him <laughs> and let's see what they say because their answer, will, their answer will show you what their presuppositions are. All right, but what did Jefferson say that the, the purpose of government is? It's to secure God-given rights. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That's the purpose. It's not to make sure you're wearing your helmet. It's not to make sure your seatbelt's buckled. Those are important things, but they're not, that's not the job of civil government. The job of civil government is protect and defend God-given rights. All right, so here's the American view of law and government, which we teach in the Institute of the Constitution. Pastor Whitney's going to give you a brief commercial for that in just a minute. There is a God. Say this after me, please. There is a God. Our rights come from him. The purpose of civil government is to protect God-given rights. Okay, this is the vertical argument. Now, not only is that a nice philosophical fancy phrase, it's the law. 
That's the law in America. The U.S. Code says the Declaration of Independence is the, is the organic law of the United States. Think about what that means. That means that if something is not consistent with that, though it purports to be law, it's not law. Right? Things that are violative of this understanding of law are not law. Now, I know that's about 99% of what you face today, right? But that's the case, right? What our founders would have called, we, 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 we talk about things like, you hear Roe v. Wade, people say Roe v. Wade's the law of the land, or Obamacare's the law of the land, or whatever. No, it's not. It can't be. When our, when our founders were in the Declaration of Independence, that document we just talked about, when they were arguing against things like the Townsend Acts and the Stamp Act and, and things that, that they were saying Parliament had no authority to do, they were, they were a nullity because Parliament had no authority to do them. And they were angry at the king for not resisting, helping them to resist that, resist Parliament. They said that, they said he is combined, this is the king they're talking about, he is combined with others, that's Parliament, to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. Say that word, those words, please, with me. Pretended legislation. One more time. Pretended legislation. That's what we ought to call these things. It's not only an accurate term, it's historic. And it's, and it's I think, very, very accurate. Right? We shouldn't be, say, well, because, just because a, a legislature passed something and an executive signed it and a court said it, it, it's valid, that doesn't matter if it's not valid. But we need to know what validates the law, right? What, what, so how do we recognize pretended legislation when we see it. Well, Blackstone talked about the law of nature, and Jefferson quoted him in the Declaration of Independence. This is revealed by God through human reason and conscience. Men, he, this is Blackstone we're talking about here, men considered as a creature must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator, for he is an entirely dependent being. It is necessary that he should in all points conform to his maker's will. The will of the maker, the will of the maker, is called the law of nature. So the law of nature is the will of God. This law of nature dictated by God himself is, the, is superior in obligation to any other. It is binding over the whole globe in all countries and at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this. This is the American understanding of law and government. And it's uh, the laws of nature's God, the doctrines thus delivered, we call the revealed or divine law, and they are to be found only in the Holy Scriptures. So test A, stay there. I just want to do this for you visually so you, so you remember this, please. All right, test A, in order for something to be valid, to be law, it has to pass this test, Right? It has to, it cannot be inconsistent with God's word or it's not law. It also has to pass muster under this. I'm holding my hand a pamphlet with the, you know, with the uh, United States Constitution and the Constitution of my state of Maryland here, right? This is, this is the, the temporal standard. So, so if, just, just, just for, for example, say Mr. Simpson and I were disagreeing on how big this, this, this podium was. He said that this was 30 inches and I said it's no more than 27 inches long. Okay, let's just say we have this disagreement, right? And we ask Pastor Lewis to be our to be our judge. He's going to judge the matter between us. He's going to say who's right and who's wrong. What does he need to bring with him? Right, he needs he needs some kind of fixed standard. I took this off. I was looking for my ruler. I couldn't find it, but sorry. I found this on my work. Okay, he needs he needs a fixed standard. So what I want to do is hold this up to you and show you the fixed standard for determining whether something is valid law. Is law or pretended legislation are these two standards, a temporal one and a, and a, and a uh, divine one, an eternal one, right? These, this is the standard, right? So if you want to determine if something is or is not law, you got to apply the standard. Okay, so just for a second here, let's talk about Roe v. Wade, right? First of all, what is Roe v. Wade? We'll talk about test B. Where did it come from? What branch of government? Right, which is the judicial branch, right? Does that branch have the power to make law? No. Then how can Roe v. Wade be law? Would our founders call Roe v. Wade law? In Norton v. Shelby County, this is way back in 1886, and by the way, I'm quoting the Supreme Court here not because it was right, it's right all the time, but because it was right this time. Okay. 
Supreme Court said this, an unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no rights, it imposes no duties, affords no protection, it creates no office, it is in legal contemplation as though it had never been passed. Okay, it's a nullity. It's the empty set. So what does the Bible say? Let's go to test A now. So Roe v. Wade fails test B. Test A, what does the Bible say about the taking of innocent life? That's not murder, right? Exodus 2013. So Roe v. Wade fails test A as well. But what if, let's play a what if. What if Congress had passed an, a law, an act allowing abortion and assumed the president signed, assumed the courts validated it, then what? Would abortion be legal? No, of course not. Of course not, because it still doesn't, it still fails these two tests, right? Right? In order to be valid, it has to, it has to meet both standards. So do we need to overturn Roe v. Wade? What do we really need? We need it to be ignored and resisted. We need elected officials, particularly we need the governor of the state of Maryland, the attorney general of the state of Maryland, to have the fortitude <laughs> to stand up and say, we don't care what you've written in Washington, D.C., and we don't care what the Supreme Court said because we know the law. We know the law, and we know that what you're talking about is not law. So we have no intention of enforcing it. But again, remember now, this isn't this. Don't confuse this with a sanctuary state idea where where we we just don't like it because it doesn't fit our. It, we we don't make up the standard. We refer to the standard, right? We refer to the standard. We need state and local officials. Who will, what, what does that say? State and local officials. Oh, oh, because they only ignorantly and mindlessly follow it. Okay. So, so we need to do like what the song says about Dred Scott, right? It, it, the, they ignored that court the, the opinion. And we should ignore court opinions. So we should. We need to do it based, we need to know the rules. We need to, we need to know the standards. So if we want to determine something is, so to, to apply the standards, we have to know the standards, right? So the more we know the Bible, the more we know the Constitution, the more equipped we are to guard our liberty and to pass that liberty on to our posterity, right? I've heard it said that you can't conquer a Christian people, a biblical literate people, because they'll see it coming. So if you want to conquer a Christian people, which I believe America was, if you want to conquer a Christian people, what do you have to do? What do you have to do? You have to, you have to de-Christianize them, right? You have to, right? And then you can conquer them. Or then they really will have conquered themselves, right? Hosea said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will reject thee also. I will also forget thy children. And John Adams said, this constitution is intended for moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate for the governance of any other. An institute on the Constitution, we've spent almost 20 years now developing materials to help you understand these and to, under, and to articulate uh, these things um, so that you can either, uh, for, for one thing, you can express them to your elected officials, and if, if they don't heed them, you can become the, the, the elected official. Um, I, I've been, I was telling that to people for about 15 years, and then in 2014, it became my time to... Uh, put my money where my mouth was, I guess, or to, to take my own advice. And so I ran for, uh, for office, and I was elected to the Anne County Council, and I, I, was, I was privileged to serve there for four years. Um, I'm going to ask Pastor Whitney, uh, okay, do, do you got the lesson now? Did you, got, you, you got the legal argument? You can, what is the first sentence? You refer to the first sentence of the Constitution? All, all lawmaking authority is vested in the Congress of the United States, right? Vested meaning can't be divested. I'm going to ask Pastor Whitney to come up here and tell you a little bit about some of our materials while I get ready to sing a song with you, okay? Pastor David Whitney, our senior instructor. Thank you. How many of you have taken our course, our U.S. Constitution course? Hey, Gary's there who's hosted it, and I believe Joe Boltler, is Joe back there? Delegate Joe? Yeah, you hosted our course as well. Wonderful, because you are equipped 
to function as our founders wanted every voting citizen to function, that they would know the Constitution thoroughly. And the aim of our course is to give you a working knowledge of the U.S. Constitution, the Declaration, and the Bill of Rights, that you will actually know it better than most elected officials, not only in Annapolis, not only in your county courthouse, but in Washington, D.C., where most of them ignore this entirely. So we've developed a 12-part course. By the way, tonight downstairs, I guess right beneath me here, we go down the stairs that way or back that way, uh, we have a table set up where you can purchase a course and take this course to your family, take it for your children, your grandchildren, everybody in your church. I don't know how many are from various churches. Everyone in your church ought to have taken this course because Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. But one of the things that we need to do in our form of government is that we, the citizens, have to know what that law is. As Michael said, if you, got, if you don't have the standard, how can you measure the guy who's asking for your vote at the door? I was uh, at home one day, and a knock came on the door, and a fellow who wanted my vote uh, for House of Delegates down there in Annapolis was at the door. So I asked him the question Michael taught us there, which is, what's the most important question you ask him? What's the purpose of government? And he responded with a deer-in-the-headlight look in his eyes, and, you know, he said, Nobody has ever asked me that question. Whoa! And so he proceeded to give me a socialist answer, level playing field, all that kind of usual stuff. So I asked him, uh, second question, have you read the United States Constitution? Because if you win this office, you're going to be taking an oath to the United States Constitution. Have you read it? Oh, yes, I've read it. Have you studied it? Oh, yes, I've studied it. Wonderful. Okay, but you're going to Maryland State House, so you need to take an oath to another document in addition to the United States Constitution, and that's the Maryland State Constitution. I asked him, have you ever read the Maryland State Constitution? No. Have you ever studied the Maryland State Constitution? No. Do you even have a copy of the Maryland State Constitution? No. At which point I ran back over the house. I grabbed my copy and said, please, here, take this copy and read it, because if you get elected, this is your job description. And I could tell you most of those down in Annapolis have never read, let alone studied, the Maryland State Constitution. So we have developed a course, the only course available anywhere in the world on the Maryland State Constitution. We're currently conducting it, but we encourage you to study the Maryland State Constitution. Another thing you need to do to fulfill your duty as a citizen that Jesus required us, rendered to Caesar, is be prepared for jury duty. That's right, you're going to receive this piece of paper in the mail. There's a summons and says, if you don't respond to this, you're in big trouble. You know, that kind of thing. Most people want to get out of jury duty. Christians should say, praise God, I've got the opportunity to serve Jesus Christ on a jury. Because if you know these standards, U.S. Constitution, Maryland Constitution, if you've got the standard of God's word in your mind and heart, you know how to judge the law. And that's your job as a juror. In fact, Article 23 of the Declaration of Rights in our Maryland Constitution currently still says that you, the jury, are to judge the law as well as the facts. In order to judge the law, you've got to know the U.S. Constitution, the Maryland Constitution, and you've got to know the Word of God. And I'm thankful there's a preacher here who preaches the Word of God faithfully every Sunday because if you don't know the Word of God and you don't know the Maryland Constitution and you don't know the U.S. Constitution, you're really not ready to be a juror. And so we at Institute on the Constitution we're not helping so much with this, although we teach the biblical view of law and government, but we want to help you be prepared to fulfill what Jesus commanded you to do. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That is, be prepared to fulfill your function as a citizen in our society. And perhaps, like our friends here, running for office and take your position in a place where you can make a difference on the issue of life on the issue of, of what a family is and all the things that are taking place in our society. So please go downstairs. We have a brochure that describes a whole bunch of our, our courses in addition to these three that I mentioned because we want to help you return America to our founder's vision of law and government, which is three things that we need to remember. One of the first is, one, there is a creator God, right? Say it with me. There is a creator God. Secondly, our rights come from him. Our rights come from him. Thirdly, the purpose of government is to... Secure those God-given rights. Secure those God-given rights. So we invite you to join us downstairs because we want to see a restoration of a godly Christian republic. Thank you, Pastor. Let's stand up, okay? Come on, stand up with me, please. All right, here's the guys part of the chorus. We do the chorus. Courts cannot make law. Courts cannot make law. The case law method has a fatal flaw because courts cannot make law. 
Now, here's what I want the ladies to do at that time. We're going to ooh, wop, wop, ooh, wop, wop, ooh, wop, wop. Courts cannot make law. Now, if you're really good and you know what I'm talking about, you go a third above that and go ooh, wop, wop, ooh. Take whatever part you want. Ooh, wop, wop. Okay, here we go. There's a battle going on, it's a war for your soul, it's a devil's deal, it's mind control. They want you to believe that you have no hope, they're counting on the fact that you are a dope. They'll tell you the rules, they'll tell you what to heed, they know that you don't question, they know that you don't read. We've lived a lie for way too long, it's time to know right from wrong, no matter what they told you all. Courts and judges cannot make law. The case law method has a fatal flaw because courts cannot make law. Here comes the chorus. You ready? Courts cannot make law. Ooh, wop, wop. Ooh, wop, wop. Courts cannot make law. You see, Congress makes the law. The courts make none. It's in the Constitution. It's in Article 1. Look it up. Read the words. Use your own two eyes. Know it well. Mark the spot. Get it memorized. Tell your children. Tell your mama. Tell your family. Tell your friends. Tell the people if they want to be free. You won't learn the truth in government schools. It's up to you to know the rules. No matter what they told you all. Courts and judges cannot make law. The case law method has a fatal flaw. <laughs> all right, you got to be better this time. Here we go. Ready? Ooh, wop, wop, yeah. Ooh, wop, wop. Ooh, wop, wop. Courts cannot make law. One more verse. You see, Dred Scott was not law, you see. They ignored the court then, and so should we. Slaughterhouse, make a mouse, Roe v. Wade. Opinions are not how law is made. That's not the way that our founders planned. So wise up and rise up across the land. Gotta spread the word till everybody knows this emperor has got no clothes no matter what they told you all. Courts and judges cannot make law. The case law method has a fatal flaw because my right, big finish. Here we go. Ready? Ooh, wop, wop. Ooh, wop, wop. Ooh, wop. I like it. One more to keep. Oh, courts cannot make law. Courts cannot make law. The case law method has a fatal flaw because courts cannot make law. Pastor Lewis, you got no excuse for not remembering this now. And the video is on sale downstairs. When you go on the road, take me with you, will you? I'm on the road. I would, I would love that. Well, God bless you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you to the speakers, Pastor Whitney as well, for your contribution. Uh, thank you for all who were here. Let me close with prayer, and then while you're on your feet, I would like to sing God Bless America. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for what's been accomplished this night. Lord, we do follow your standard, and you are the one who said that we need to be educated. We need to know your word, and it's a shame that there are so many biblically illiterate people out there today. And so, Lord, I would just pray that we would purpose to get in the word of God, that we would draw closer to you by knowing your word, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you take such good care of us. I ask you now as we prepare to depart that you would put your hedge about each and every one of us. Keep us safe on our way home. Wake us up tomorrow morning, dear Lord, uh, encouraged and excited about what we've learned tonight, what we can do, Father, as Christians in this land to make it the place it was intended to be. We thank you for all the blessings that you have sent our way down through the years. We pray that it would continue. Again, Father, we thank you for all that we've done here. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And now, a cappella. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the lights is the lights of above.
should be safe going home. Please stop downstairs at the tables and avail yourself of the information. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.